Hello, welcome to the podcast. I'm here with Ian McLean, who's the managing director of John Smedley, which is without doubt one of the two great wool manufacturers and retailers in our country. Thank you very much. Ian, can I ask you first, the potted version, the two minute version of the distinguished history of the family firm? Of course. Um, so I, I'm um, the managing director of the company, but I'm also a member of the family that owns the business. So it is still a family owned company and has been since the beginning when it started. How are you a family member? Is your... uh, so my, my grandmother was a Smedley on Got the father's it. side. Yeah. Um, and the business this year is 236 years old. So the history goes right back to the beginning of the Industrial Revolution. John Smedley's factory in Derbyshire was one of the very first factories to be built and the only factory of its kind that still operates right from the very beginning. And so we like to think of ourselves as the oldest manufacturing factory in the world, still doing you know, roughly the same sort of thing we did when we started. We started as a cotton spinning business, mm -hmm. but the real wealth of John Smedley was created in the 1820s to 1850s when John Smedley converted his, his cotton spinning machinery to also be able to spin wool. Mm -hmm. And ever since then, our business has been making cotton products in the summertime and wool products in the wintertime. So we have an all year round business, which is heavily based around wool. And as I say, still family owned, which is very, very unusual in this day and age. Um, we employ around 350 people in our factories and we make all of our garments in the UK, knitting everything um, in our factories in the UK and distributing them around the world. Are they all in one factory? Two factories, one in Derbyshire and one in South Yorkshire. Very good. Um, and as I say, the UK is the biggest market. Uh, Japan, which you'll probably talk about later, is, is, is the second biggest market. But being very old, we are known in many markets around the world. And so we go as far as um, uh, the Soviet Union, of, of Russia and, and uh, New Zealand and Australia, we export all, all, to all places around the world, which makes for an interesting business because it means some of your risk is spread through different markets and different places. And so here we still are making the same products 236 well, years later. Here we are sitting in German Street in your German Street shop, one of your three London shops. I think I was mentally working it out down the street you're, you're younger than Fortnum and Mason, you're older than Wilton's next door, no, <laughs> and you must be, I think you're also older than Paxton and Whitfield. Oh, right, okay. Um, but it, there's, a, there's a group, I would say, of about five yes. you go from end to end. And yet we're sitting in an extremely modern shop. Yes. Um, it's, uh, I think you've been very clever in the way that all your stores mm. are not oldie worldy, are they? Describe them. How would you describe this store? Well, I think, I think the concept behind the idea, and you're right, it is modern. It, it does have some imagery, like we see the imagery of the old factory, and those pictures were taken in the 1920s. But we as a business are still not, we're not operating back in the 1920s. And I feel that, you know, the one thing that is, one of the things that has kept John Smedley going over this very long period is that we've always tried to be um, stylish, not necessarily fashionable, but, but in a sense of the moment. So we have to keep moving forward. I think if we ever get stuck in the past, that's probably the end of the business. And you might say, well, you know, 100 years ago, this business was making long johns and long underwear. Yeah. If we had that business today, we wouldn't be in existence. We've had to transform and move forward all the time. Do you make any long johns at all? Does anyone wear long johns? We don't anymore, no. I think that the skiing market is supplied by um, cut and sewn long johns that we can't... Um, compete with on price, um, but we found our niche today in the outerwear market, whether it's polo shirts for the summer or pullovers for the winter time, and that gives us a customer and, and a customer base and a market to go at which is good enough for us at the moment. I'm looking at your signage behind me, and what I'm seeing are very, a kind of Rather cool classics. That's, mm. is, is that how you like correct. to see yourself? Yes. John Smedley is predominantly a brand that supplies accessory pieces to people who have already bought their suit or their shirt or their skirt or their blouse to wear in the office environment or in a social environment and the knitwear part kind of goes with it. So very much the classics are the core of the business 
But if we only sold classics, everybody would get terribly bored and not come back every season. So, as you know, uh, you know, fashion is very important, and those fashionable colours that we introduce each season are what bring customers into the shop um, again and again. Do you have any sense of how long people tend to keep the pieces? I know that it, with a very, very mass company, the exact opposite of yourself, Top Shop, hmm. they reckon about 21 days is the oh. longest anybody keeps <laughs> anything they bought in Top Shop, so I hear. But w with a John Smedley piece, yes. where they're very, very beautifully made, and the wool ones, of which I have particular affection, of course, um, could last, can last, for years. Yes, generations you... even. Um, I mean, I, I, in my position as managing director, I, ha I have oversight of the entire business. But I do feel um, a particular connection with the customer service department and talking to customers because that, you know, fundamentally, if customers ever decided for some reason uh, not to buy a product from us, it would be a disaster. You know, it would be the end of the business. So keeping a connection directly with consumers is very important to me. And sometimes I receive either emails or letters from consumers thanking us for our wonderful products and they inherited a jumper from their father or their mother and they've had them for 25 years plus and, the, and, and somehow a small hole has appeared and could we possibly mend it? So that those kind of... And can you possibly oh, mend we it? we can, yes, absolutely. Yes. God, is that yeah. really so? So if I sent back a John Smedley jersey that was 25 years old, there would be someone who would welcome it? Absolutely, yes. How we, impressive. We, in fact, the, the, the ladies who who mend garments are the most skilled employees that we have. They're extremely valuable to us and we don't have very many of them, but we can cope with pretty much any kind of mending process that's required. And, and as I say, every now and again, I do get those kind of letters and those comments from customers, which implies that garments are lasting 10, 15, 20 years in people's wardrobes if they're well looked after. So that's the definition of longevity, not 21 days, 21 years. Well, this we love. I can't actually resist asking you, since I have you, what, do you do, what is the moth situation? Do you, is there a smedley secret to stopping them somehow eventually getting in? We have a, a technical director in, in our business called Tim Clark, who's been with us for, I think, nearly 30 years and came to us as a student. And he is the most technically knowledgeable and adept individual, probably in our entire industry. And what I've learned from him about the moth and the moth's desire to eat wool Ooh. is that it really boils down to if your jumper has a little bit of food on it or a little bit of drink spilt on it, it's the sugars in those, in those items which cause the moth, which is what the moth wants to eat. The moth doesn't necessarily want to eat the wool itself. So if the wool is clean always and put away yeah. nicely, it should be resistant to moth. And it's actually extra things that aren't there that the moth is after. That's what he tells me. Well, that's incredibly and he's interesting. he's the expert. <laughs> In a way, we should take it as a compliment because we, we need, wool needs all the consumers it can get. Yes. Although what moths might not be the top of the, at the, top of the list. No. I want to thank you and to thank John Smedley for the support of the Prince of Wales's campaign for wool. You were one of the first um, companies that showed interest in it. How do you feel at the moment about where wool is? We're under some pressure, the farmers are under some pressure, mm. but how do you feel the consumer feelings mm. about wool are? Mm. Well, we certainly have our fans, you know, that, that's, that's a great starting point. I think the challenge for all of us, and you'll know this, and, and the farmers will know this equally well, is the education okay. about the product. Um, you know, every generation that comes along needs to be told the story and the story in the right way to understand that wool is a biodegradable product, it's part of the carbon cycle naturally, and you know, it, it's, it has all kinds of amazing properties that um, you know, are not immediately apparent but need to be understood uh, for people to make the right choices. And I think that is a, a situation which is ongoing and will always be the case. And all of us just have to get better at telling those stories. And I think that we're in the right place now where issues of sustainability are moving up the agenda in all their forms very, very rapidly. And we have to be there to not only answer the questions, 
but to say, you know, why is wool the right choice for people? I think we need to evangelise for wool, as you say, literally every day, yes. because we're up against very strong competitors, yes. and there are many, many messages out there, and we have to continue. I always thought one of the great demonstrations that the Prince of Wales got involved with was when we buried the two jumpers mm. in the flower bed in uh, Clarence House. Yes. And I was very, very worried in case this great demonstration didn't work, yes. because Prince Charles came along with his rather marvellous silver spade, yes. and he, he, <laughs> he dug the two holes, and yes. we put into one hole the wool jersey, and into the other one we put a lycra or some... Um, I think it was a polyester one, I think. It was mostly a, polyester. Mostly yeah. polyester. And then four months later, we had the press of the world, That's including right, yeah. the TV news, to come and watch them, us yeah. dig them up again. Yes. And I had this terrible anxiety that perhaps it wasn't going to work, but yes. it could not have been more brilliant. Yes. I mean, the wool one, having had by biodegraded almost completely yes. in four months, the worms were thick in it and it was going back to nature and yes. the circle of life. Yes. The polyester one, Frankly, you could have taken it out, you could have put it in the machine, yes, or, and you could have washed it and you could have worn it again. And that damn jersey in polyester is going to be on our planet mm. for how many years? 700 mm. years. Mm. It's, people will be able to dig it up and mm. wear it again um, the, in the most horrible way. What for me was the even more shocking follow-up to that was that Alex James, you know, who did the digging up, uh, then went on to make his television program about wool and yep. synthetic yarns. And in his barn, he set fire to both garments. Yep. And the wool garment, you know, you took, put a blowtorch to it and, it and it kind of smoked a bit, but you literally couldn't set it on fire. But when you press the same blowtorch against the polyester garment, it goes up like a, an oil burning stove. I mean, there's flames and the thing melts and it drips on the floor. And it was just, it was shocking. Really, really shocking. But it, was, it was utterly sensational as a demonstration. Absolutely. We did it again in New Zealand. And then, of course, we did it in Clarence House first. And those bits of, um, of filming, which are all on YouTube, have mm. been watched by frankly, millions of mm. people mm. looking at it. And it is such a message, mm. isn't it? Mm. If you're at a party and you're wearing something that isn't wool and a cigarette lands on you, mm. the thing can go up in, and the worst ones Second, are fancy yeah. dress yes. outfits. They are always made of the absolutely worst and cheapest um, synthetics mm. that can be got. Mm. And you'd be crazy to stand, if you're warming your bottom on a fire wearing one of those, yes. you could be boiled alive yes. in a, in I seconds. Those stories, I mean, what's clever about those things, and, and you achieved it with the burying of the garments, and Alex achieved it with the trying to light them up, is it, it's, it's not necessarily what's behind those stories, it's how you tell them. Yeah. Because, you know, and, and we need to find more ways to tell stories in such a way that people will pay attention, you know, cutting through all the noise of everything else that it, people need to understand in the day. And get these messages across, and that's that's tremendously mm. difficult, but 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 critical if we are to push forward with our agenda on the benefits of wool. I think. Completely agree. You're not, of course, at really in the carpet industry, but my goodness, the half truths. If you go to any out of town um, carpet, one of those big carpet warehouses, mm. and you speak to the guys or women who are selling, trying to sell you carpet mm. and you ask them to compare wool and synthetics, mm. they always use the most annoying expression. Mm. They say, this synthetic one is bleach cleanable, as if that was somehow a marvellous thing. And they never say, as Even we all words. know, yeah. that with a wool carpet, as with a wool sweater, mm. as with wool skirts, mm. you can um, clean them tremendously effectively yeah, if somebody yeah. drops um, red wine. Before we leave the history, I mm. want to ask you about the Florence Nightingale okay. connection. Yes, of course. Explain it to well, me. Well, I brought two publications here from our archive team. So, you know, John Smedley is a very old business. We have a tremendous archive, and in, in your V&A uh, capacity, you, you will understand this, but in terms of garments, we have over um, 10,000 knitted garments in our archive, which is astonishing going right back i think the oldest garment dates to about 1847 i think we've adopted at that but 
part of the process of setting up the archive was not only to put our archive assets like the garments and other artifacts and documents into it, but then to start to tell the stories out of it. Yes. And that has been an amazing process. For example, a great, great uncle of mine, uh, uh, John Marsden Smedley, mm -hmm. took a ship in 1865 all the way from Bristol right down to Australia uh, over many months to find a new source of merino wool for our company. And, and the lengths we went to to sort of do those things is quite extraordinary as a, as a family business, dating right back to those days. Coming to the, the Florence Nightingale story, that is, that is absolutely fascinating. Um, I was unaware until quite recently uh, that the Nightingale family had two family homes, one in Derbyshire, which was their summer home, and one in, near Seven Oaks, which was their winter home. So every summer they would come to Derbyshire, mm -hmm. and that home was literally only half a mile from our factory. And in fact, the, the Nightingale family, before Florence came along, her great uncle, owned the land on which the John Smedley factory was built in 1784. Interesting. So John Smedley leased the building and off the land that was owned by the Nightingales. And he, our family were tenants, in it, if you like, as a business, of the Nightingale family for over a hundred years. And ultimately, in, in 1894, mm -hmm. my great-grandfather formed a limited company for John Smedley. So John Smedley mm -hmm. became a limited company for the first time and not a partnership. Mm -hmm. And in the same year, he decided that the limited company should buy the freehold of the factory site. So he negotiated with the Nightingale family to buy the freehold, and the contract was drawn up. And the signatories to the contract on our side were my great-grandfather, and on the Nightingale side, Florence signed the document. Oh, how very interesting. She was nine, sorry, sorry, she was 70 at the time. She was world yes. famous. Mm -hmm. She was living in London, uh, I believe um, near to, um, well, near here actually, not very far from here. And uh, she signed the contract. So I have her signature on the contract when we bought the, the property site. And that's the background to some of this information here. What is also contained in this document is that when she was a teenager growing up yep. in Derbyshire in the summer, she would travel around the local villages around our area with her mother, um, administering health advice, looking in on people, helping people out as they did in those days because there was no national health service. And the Nightingales ended up paying for the local doctor and paying for a local teacher in the local school. And in a sense, we can trace Florence's interest in medicine and nursing right back to those days when she was at ministering those kind of ideas in her local village right next to our factory. I wonder whether amazing. she took any John Smedley pieces to the Crimea, to Scutari, where she started we her are, famous uh, hospital. That's correct. We are attempting to find that out. I believe we have invoices which show that we didn't make garments, but we made bandages, which her father purchased from us to be sent out to where she was at that time. Oh, That's as they as presumably would yes. mostly have been cotton bandages, but Correct. perhaps not entirely. You may have may have been uh, wool as well. Yeah, wool. could have been. Yeah, oh, fascinating. But yeah, the the, process, the research is ongoing, and, and I'm sure the stories, more stories, will come out over time. Well, moving the story right up to now, I want to thank you for your support of the campaign for wool student competition, mm. and um, because which, which is something I happen to think is one of the most useful things that the campaign does as a uh, as an occasional thing because it's such a what i love about it is the way that it reaches out to the fashion schools and mm -hmm. art colleges where i sometimes think the idea of wool is taught much less than it should be mm -hmm. and one's very surprised how sometimes students are able to pass out with a very good degree having done mm -hmm. two or three years there and they have not really been introduced to wool at all yes and, and this is a way of introducing and secondly I love the way that the winners and some of the other students who are sort of in the in the finals get to know some of these companies mm. and get to meet 
sort of adults who are working in a proper, profitable, That's important true. business. Yes. And it's an extremely good way in, quite apart from the fact that of how important it is actually for people, um, just normal shoppers. Mm. It's another way to remind people all the time, A, of the great brands that are still using mm. wool, mm. and secondly, that the next generation are, are learning about mm. it. I think for us, it, I think there are two very important things. You're absolutely right about the material. That, that's critical in understanding aspects of the material not just in a theoretical sort of university environment, but in a practical environment where the material is, 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 is worked with is very important. But also I feel that, you know, there's an entire generation of designers out there in their 30s, 40s, 50s who helped, in a sense, through the forces of globalization to take the British knitting industry out of Britain and send it to foreign countries, whether that's China, India, Sri Lanka, Vietnam, all those kind of places, you know, the industry moved, the manufacturing part of it moved entirely abroad. And, 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 and a knowledge was lost to a younger generation who start to come through the education process and are unable to see a factory because there are so few factories left. And it's very difficult for a student in, say, Derbyshire yeah. to go to Sri Lanka to see a factory because it's so jolly far away. But, but today I feel it's critical that we, with our factory still in Derbyshire and another one in Yorkshire, have the ability to show a new generation of students who are learning design, learning about materials, how things are made. And we can do that in our factories. And that, and that is critically important because if we can do that and we can show that it's possible, then perhaps we can turn the tide in some small way and start to bring manufacturing back. And don't Britain. we think at the same time that sentiment, for the first time, is really starting to go back that way? Mm. I've noticed with my own children that they're not terribly thrilled at all when they know that things that they bought from some of the big high street chains mm. have been made in Bangladesh, yes. almost certainly in one of those yes. powder keg um, factories. Yes. Uh, people are, there's a, quite a stronger conscience than there used to be. And I don't, I personally think mm. that when I see the word made in England or manufactured mm. in England, I personally think that's worth plus 50% mm. on whatever you're going to be charged yeah. as you leave the shop. Yeah. So you feel, you feel good. I think it's absolutely right. And I think, I think what I find is that in some senses, um, if you look at John Smedley, we are a dinosaur. You know, we are a, a leftover entity of a, of a previous age. And I know very clearly that we cannot regrow an industry in the image that, that I have it in. It's not possible. However, if you look around very carefully, you will find that there are young people out there who are starting new businesses in new ways, uh, picking up new challenges and building sustainability into their approach with, and also localism, as you said, mm. making things with a very short supply chain and using all kinds of creative ways to do this, that I feel quite positive, actually, about how a new industry will be built in the future. Not in the image of me, but with all these new ideas. And that in itself, I think, will be more sustainable. And if they can use wool, some of which will be grown within the UK itself, that's even better. And, and I do see that happening. It's an amazing thing but I do see it. <clears throat> well, can I on that highly optimistic and I think true note, thank you, not as a dinosaur, but <laughs> as a hero heritage brand, which much. is how we all see you. Thank you. <laughs>